All right, I am Dr. Tara Farr. I am a chiropractor at Brown Family Chiropractic, and we are excited to start our lecture series off this year. Um, Dr. Rudy Byron of Byron Health and Healing. Hello. Um, is joining me tonight um, for Anxiety Remedies for Relaxation. So um, this is our first lecture in this location in our own clinic. So we're just really excited that I don't have to drive somewhere in this ucky cold weather to another location of these series. So it's kind of fun just to hop on back here and have it all in one place. So that's super awesome. Um, little things I want to touch on before we start. Um, this is a free lecture for anybody who wants to come. Um, we do free community lectures. This is funded and hosted by a nonprofit I started called Healthy Spines Initiative of Wisconsin, where we're doing community health outreaches um, and providing chiropractic screening and chiropractic care for um, low income or people who can't afford it. So if you can donate at all, I do have a donation um, bucket over there and a little bit more information about my nonprofit. Um, you can also visit my website, www.hsi-wi.org, and there's a donate buddy, but button on there as well. Um, so uh, we love doing these lecture series. It keeps us sharp. It keeps us um, connected with you guys and keeps you guys um, on the verge of learning and promoting health. So today we are discussing anxiety remedies for relaxation. Um, and this topic is very important, and I want to, you to consider taking a look at your breaths and seeing if you notice it adjust during this discussion. So I talk about breathing very often in my, my practice and how we in America tend to shallow breathe. We get stressed, and you can see the shoulders rising. And so throughout the day, and, and as I'm working in my stressful, busy day I've had today, and um, or if a patient comes in frazzled, they're late, you know, I just got stuck at a train. Take a breath, breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, fill those lungs, because it's amazing what just oxygenating your body can do for your mind, body, and spirit. So as we know, our breath is very much tied to how we feel. And so if we feel stressed, we will notice that our breath becomes very shallow. We notice, um, and if we notice we are feeling nice and relaxed, we breathe like a sleeping baby. That kind of billowy, puffy breath through our abdomen, right? You've seen those babies sleep and their abdomens rise and fall. So again, just take a moment, center yourself, and get a sense of if you are in this relaxed state or not. And if you are not, um, relax a little bit more. Take some big, deep breaths because as you try to understand this information we're about to discuss tonight um, into your knowledge base, the more relaxed you are and the more you incorporate deep breathing, the more it will integrate into your memory. So as we move forward and we talk about stress and anxiety, the goal is to be relaxed and understand a better way to deal with it. Because we know that stress, if unchecked for long periods of time, can cause significant contributions to your symptoms and your conditions. Now there's a whole host of issues, and us as primary care physicians see it every day. Um, so many of them can be reduced or possibly reversed if we can get proper management of that stress factor. So what is stress? We throw around that word all the time, but what does it really mean? Well, Dr. Hans Selye, um, that defined it as the nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. Now the first thing to understand that it says it is a nonspecific response, which means that it's not the same thing that happens every single time you get stressed for all kinds of stress. And that action can happen whenever your body perceives a demand for change. So you might be thinking, hmm, this is still hard for me to grasp. My goal is to make sure that this is not a stressful lecture for you guys. Um, so let's look at this definition in another way. When your body has to respond to a demand for change, meaning whenever you feel that there's a need for change, your body has to go thrust through some sort of stress effect. And you might be feeling a little overwhelmed right now because as we look at this definition, you might think, my goodness, isn't life all about change? So is it that I'm doomed to be stressed all the time because I'm always going to be demanded for change of something? 
whether it is for my boss, my job, my spouse, my children, my finances, they always require change constantly through life. But please have hope. There are solutions that we're going to talk about today. So the first thing I want to explore with you is for you to understand that it's not just one type of stress. That stress, as we use it, can mean dis distress. And distress is something negative, right? So if you had a negative feeling about a situation, or let's say you didn't get that job, or that you feel physically bad, um, these are all types of distress in the body. But equally stressful, even though we don't talk about it that way, is the demand for change for something good in your life. So think about getting that job. Think about the stress and anxiety of that trans transition and making sure you're performing well in that new position. And even though you're excited to get that promotion, there's still some demand for change that your body has to meet to get to that next level of that change. So remember those two categories. So whenever you're in a situation, you always have to wonder, how is that person perceiving that stressful situation? So I'm cluing you in on this big factor um, that you have and, and the power that you have behind this perception of stress. Now we look at that definition and you see it's really about that demand for change right, on the body, or our expectation. Because most of the time when we are stressing, it is some sort of expectation or worry that we are boiling around in our brains, in our minds, or in our hearts that cause the physical symptoms, right? I've been through medical school. I've had the stress of getting through board exams and examinations. My gut feels it, my body feels it, my immune system feels it, right? How many of you have gone through a stressful period of time just to finish so you could go on vacation and then you get sick, right? So that shows that there's this stress connection, um, mind-body um, connection with our perception of stress and how we handle it in our body. So you see, you have the ability to really control your world based on how you see that world. If you, as you know it, see the world as metaphorically the half glass, or half glass empty, um, then that demand for change will increase quite a bit. If you're always just melancholy, oh, today's gonna be awful, you know, that demand for stress on the body is gonna be exponential. But for those people who have acceptance and compassion, they will find that they don't need that demand for change, that they will live and they will give, but they don't always expect something. So you, you will find that, um, that the number of expectations you have likely relate to the amount of stress you have in your life. So this does not mean to lower your expectations or your standards. That's not what I mean at all. But I want you to continue to go for your best in life. But you have to um, have the expectation that it's always gonna work out for me. We know that it doesn't always do that, right? So um, having that acceptance that, okay, this is a situation I'm in, this is all I can do about it, how can we move on and move forward from this situation? And that can help reduce the stress impact on the physical body. So we have found that the way you see the world is really how you are going to feel. Have you ever been around those people that just everything is awful? And then you can just feel that energy that they have. They see the world as it's against them, right? Um, and we don't want to feel that way, so that's what we're going to discuss today. And the way you see that world and how you feel will, will, return, will determine the body's demand for those changes. So incorporating things like tolerance, acceptance, and compassion, all these things reduce your expectations and help reduce the suffering related to those expectations that didn't pan out the way you thought. So let me give you a little example of this. Let's imagine a scenario when you're sitting on a plane. My mom's in Costa Rica right now. I sure wish I was in Costa Rica right now. Um, so this, I, I fly quite frequently. Um, I like to travel. But imagine you're on a plane at night, and I love being on a plane at night, especially when you're passing over the lights of the city. Um, you can adjust it a little bit if you need to. Um, passing over the lights of the city, and you see all those twinkling lights and those little cars as you you drive and move, um, and I think, wow, what a wonderful world we live in. And I get very enlightened experiencing and just understanding my place within the universe when I'm flying over big cities and seeing 
all the little life below me. Now I find that very grounding, I find it very peaceful, and I, it kind of puts things into perspective for me. And then I look over at some of the people that are sitting around me, and I might see a young man gripping his armrest, panting, just, you can see his whole body is tense, and you can know he's thinking, oh my gosh, are we going to die right now, right? <laughs> and you can see it in his face, his whole facial structure, his body, his breath pattern, show that he is in fear mode. And he is looking at that same beautiful scenery that I am seeing, but he sees it completely different than I do, right? And because he views it so differently, he feels that differently. And then the body is asked for a demand for change for him. And, then it's, and that is when he decides or chooses to have that different response on his body. Now we can choose how we perceive our stress more than we think. So let's look at another example. Because, because really the tragic or the humorous is a matter of perspective, right? Now, I try to make a habit of having some gratitude in my life every day. I wake up, before I put my feet on this earth, I say to myself, for a few minutes, what am I grateful for? This has been shown to be very, very good for you. So I encourage you guys to start implementing this in your life. So I might be grateful for my family, my husband, my beautiful children, but sometimes I'm just grateful for my warm, fuzzy blanket I'm wrapped in, or the clean air I'm breathing. Um, or, you know, the coffee that's brewing in the, in the downstairs kitchen at that moment. Something like a fuzzy carpet I get to walk on. Something that may not be huge or divine, but something that I'm just happy to have in my life in that moment. And if I really flood myself with all these positive thoughts, then I decide I'm going to start that day and I'm going to be happy. Because look, I'm looking at all the things I have to be grateful for in that moment. Then I step out of my bed, I walk towards the bathroom, and I stub my big toe on the corner of the wall, right? And in that moment, I say, well, I stub my toe, but you know what? It's not a big deal. I have so many other things to be grateful for, so let's move on with my day and be happy. And it kind of just happens like that, right? Now I'm going to describe another scenario for you that's very common in my life as well, because I'm not perfect. But when I look at the world as something of a threat, like, what is going to happen that day? Or what do I have to get done that day? Or, oh my goodness, there are so many things I have to do and so little time. So those kinds of mornings that I wake up and to the alarm screaming at me and suddenly this list of things goes off in my brain and the, all the things I need to accomplish that day, kind of like this morning when I woke up to do this whole lecture, um, and then I would start to feel, um, get all those feelings that, of things I haven't done and need to do, and where I need to go and get the kids ready for school. And then I get into this fear state, right? And when I get into this fear state, I pop out of my bed, I jump towards the bathroom because I'm already running late and I stub my toe on the wall. And then I feel like the world is against me and I'm gonna have a bad day and I have all these things to accomplish and this is just the last thing I need to start my day off with, right? So. You can see how, how you are feeling can be translated in your, your emotions and how you act for that day. It's almost like my emotions leading up to that moment fed into me reacting to that stub toe. And so you really do have that power to change so many things in your life by changing your perception. Just clouding your mind with positive thoughts so you see the world a little differently um, as opposed to flooding it with those negative thoughts. So now let's talk a little bit more about the science and what kind of happens in the body because we do understand that there's a connection in the way we behave and to the way that our body behaves. So in our body there's this gland that sits right above the kidney. It's about a walnut sized gland called your adrenal glands. Has anybody heard of your adrenal glands? Some of my patients do. Yeah, we've talked about it. So your adrenal glands have two parts, the outer shell and the inner core. Now the outer shell secretes or releases two key hormones that I want to talk about cortisol and DHEA and the inner core releases um, two that you may know about already norepinephrine and epinephrine have you guys heard of those terms now you might have heard them um, like them use of the word of, of, of adrenaline have you heard of the adrenaline rush um, and remember the base of that word is adrenal adrenaline adrenal 
So adrenaline or the adrenal glands activate when your body perceives any sort of stress. So historically, it was a tiger, right? We always talk about this tiger situation. You see that tiger, your eyes see the tiger, your brain perceives that tiger, it says, oh no, there is fear. I have fear for potential danger. I must change my situation to get myself out of that situation. And it sends a signal, so my brain and eyes perceive this, it sends a signal down to the adrenal glands, um, and the adrenal glands then start to release these hormones of survival. In order to set aside the, the cas cascade of everything else, we must survive this moment, right? When the adrenals is not overly activated from per perceived stress, the adrenal has a chance to function normally every single day. Like, we have them. Um, they're not overly used, hopefully. Um, so it does not put out excess levels of these hormones, if, and we can live a long, normal functioning life. So remember that your body is designed to handle a certain amount of stress in those situations, but if it's overwhelmed constantly with this stress, these adrenal systems, we have the ability to create this dysfunction in the body with the adrenal glands. And it is normal to have stress in our lives. That's why they're there. That's why we have these glands. But the goal is not to have unnecessary stress. So cortisol, uh, being a stress hormone, is actually coming out to protect you. It does this because it perceives that you must need something for the danger that you're receiving. So it increases. Does anybody know what cortisol increases? Sugar and fat. Because it assumes you need energy to run from that tiger. Okay. It puts you in rescue mode, and it works with that adrenaline to make sure that you can run and fight and survive that tiger. It also tries to soothe the body in a certain way because it knows that if it kicks up the, the storm in your body to fight the tiger um, or do what it needs to do, it has the ability to calm you down as well. It directs the immune system, and it actually directs all other hormones in the body. It takes over. Because the body has decided when your brain perceives that stress it sees, everything else needs to change to adjust to that perceived danger. Now the opposite, or the counterbalance to this, cortisol is DHEA. Have any of you heard of that? Some of ya. Now DHEA is another hormone that is released by the outer cortex um, of the adrenal glands, and it is what helps counterbalance that cortisol. So cortisol is that stress response, DHEA, we kind of call the anti-stress. So remember, cortisol comes out whenever this stress arises. And remember, it could be that good stress of, got that job, you know, or I'm, I'm going to have to work harder to, to demand for that promotion. Or it could be a bad stress or any demand for a change in our normal routine. Now, DHEA, once the cortisol comes out, helps to counter that effect. So it is that anti-stress hormone and actually is linked to anti-aging. Um, so you can look at the levels of DHEA, and the higher the numbers, the better. You can think of it as they haven't been used up trying to counterbalance the cortisol that's been released constantly. And because the cortisol hasn't come out constantly, there hasn't been a ton of perceived stress. So it tends to be a calming type of hormone. Now, a bit of caution, I don't want you all to say, oh, DHEA is wonderful, let me go to a health food store and just start taking a ton of DHEA because it has anti-aging benefits. It doesn't work out that way. We have to make sure and respect the body that has a certain balance that we want to achieve. And we all know that more of something is not always better, right? So you always want to make sure that you take a look at these with a qualified healthcare professional to see if having DHEA supplementation is right for you. Now we are constantly bombarded with things like poor sleep in this country, noise pollution, air pollution, diet, the standard American diet or the sad diet we call it, anger, sadness, poor social relationship, Facebook likes, someone didn't like my Facebook you know, posts, whatever, nutritional deficiencies, worry, all these things, whether they are physical or emotional, bombard us and bombard, bombard our reserves for that demand for change. And you can see so much of your control has to do with your brain and perce the perception of that stress um, and how it sees things differently so that your adrenal glands have that chance to rest sometimes. So this is what we're going to talk about. How we perceive that stress depicts whether that brain signals those adrenal glands or not. 
because we see what happens when we activate those adrenal glands all the time you know and we live in a culture of go 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 we don't take vacations in america like europe takes a month off every year you know so our level of stress is completely different than it was 100 to 200 years ago they didn't have all the pesticides they spray on the food the air pollutants the 40-hour work weeks you know they were out in nature more connecting with the earth um, and it's not just what we think in terms of burning out um, but let's look at some specific things when your brain commands your adrenals and your adrenal remember is the conductor of all these other functions in the body as long as your body is communicating well it tells your brain okay this is what we decided based on what you think now this is what happens when your adrenal glands get activated too often Remember, we said that it increases, which ones? The cortisol and... Oh, well, what? what? Sugar, sugar and, and fat. fat. Yeah. Okay, so it increases blood sugar, but it also can break down muscle for glutamine. Now, glutamine is important for lining repair. So it's trying to, I mean, this is a, a, a survival mode. It's trying to help you with what it anticipates you will need in that state of stress. And remember, it will increase body fat in case you need some storage, in case you haven't eaten in a few days because back then it used to be a stress response to starvation. In case you haven't, um, uh, so it is anticipating that maybe you need that extra fuel for your system to survive those few days if you got caught by that tiger and someone's looking at for you for a few days. It gives you everything you need to get to that survival mode until you can rest. Um, so you may have some extra body fat if you're constantly in a state of stress. And this is one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to lose weight when they're constantly in the state of stress. And then it also breaks down bone for calcium. Now let's look at this even more. I want to see what else happens when we're just constantly in the state of adrenaline rush and go, go, go. Well, if you keep stressing, if you keep thinking you need change, more help is on the way. Your adrenals will keep giving you what you ask for constantly. They're constantly on, which is what we see all the time in our practice. So it reduces your thyroid function. It reduces your antibody production. These are like secret weapons in your immune system that help fight infection. So it will reduce your overall immunity, especially in your gut. I love talking about the gut. We should do a gut class soon. Um, your gut is so important to your whole immune system and your whole immune system starts to weaken. And we've seen autoimmune diseases very prevalent, especially in the Midwest. So let's see how those changes affect you. For instance, if you have prolonged storage of fat because your adrenals are always on, you can see how that will cause weight issues that we have in our country right now. We can't deny that, right? How about blood sugar imbalances that the adrenal glands cause when it's constantly activated? Blood sugar goes up. This can explain why we have diabetes and metabolic syndrome and, and is on the rise in our country. How about the loss of muscle and the underactive thyroid? That explains weight gain, but it also explains how we age much quicker now. We injure much easier and we have less longevity less good years of life. My philosophy, I've said it probably 10 times a day, my goal in life is to live long and die short. In our country right now, I'm seeing it constantly, we are living short and dying long because of all of the chronic issues we're dealing with, with our health and um, wellness. And cancer used to be a disease of seniors, and we're starting to see that wearing down our bodies even earlier now. We talked about the loss of bone and how that explains earlier bone diseases we're seeing. And then we all know that when we deplete our immune system from stress, we get sicker easier. So you can see how this all works back and forth when your body health, when your body health is better, that helps your brain health and your adrenal health. But if your brain health is better and your perception of stress is better, then that helps your adrenal glands and can help your overall body. So it's very simple when I, you think about this, to start implementing this in your life today, before you leave here. We could be all stressed about the ice storm that's probably coming, but we can just take a breath, right? Does this take a deep breath? <sighs> know that if we drive slowly and carefully, we can a better chance of getting home safely tonight, right? So what else can we do besides start to change this mindset of how we perceive stress? Sleep is very important. 
um, sleeping seven to nine hours of night and practice relaxation techniques. Turn off the computers, turn off the TV that's overstimulating, you know, if you're watching a scary movie that's already sending you in a state of adrenaline rush. Um, you know, I try to read a book for 20 minutes before I go to bed just to calm, calm my mind, to calm my body and prepare me for that sleep. And usually I get to a page where I can't even read anymore, so I gotta go to bed anyway. Anyways, um, try to write down things and make a to-do list if you're worried that you won't remember something. I mean, I've woken up in the middle of the night and like, oh, I gotta do that tomorrow, write this, I gotta email that person, you know? So start to write it down, create checklists so you're not constantly trying to keep it in your brain and on that constant state of stress. And remember that food is information for your adrenal glands. And this is really, and it is, so it's really smart to eat breakfast and not those refined foods like processed bagels and cereals and donuts, but, and those are not the ideal breakfast because they're gonna spike your blood sugar and then your adrenals are gonna respond, right? Um, but they really work, those, those type, kind of foods really work your adrenal glands unnecessarily. So eat more fruits and vegetables and eat less sweets and sugary drinks. How about eating protein with each meal to help regulate your blood sugar a little bit more? We want to limit caffeine and alcohol, again, because you tend to, those tend to act as stimulants in the body and tend to overwork the adrenal glands. And last but not least, eat good fats. Yes, I'm telling you to eat fat. Things like salmon, fats from nuts and seeds, avocados, and try to avoid things like fried foods. Tomorrow's Friday, do not go to Friday night fish fry. And all those bad fats, you can read labels if it says trans fats, not good. Um, and remember how you think and how you and feel absolutely determines how your adrenal glands behave long term. So think about how adjusting how you perceive that world um, so you can be in that same world but start seeing things differently. Remember, I'm hoping um, that, not o that you're not only incorporating that deep breathing techniques to help your adrenals and your brain um, by not seeing such a stressful state in the world, um, but you're actively incorporating daily things to find peace with yourself and in this world. Whether you're doing it through tolerance and acceptance and compassion. And, um, and to end this, I'd like for my portion, I like to quote the words of a very relaxed man who lived to the wonderful age of 100, George Burns. He's a comedian, anybody know him? Um, he said, if you ask what the single most important key to longevity, I would have to say is avoiding worry, stress, and tension. And if you didn't ask me, I'd still have to say it. So he understood that a big part of this health was just having a different perspective. So I hope that you have the ability to look at your life, make those stressors turn into potential stressors and then no stressors because you have a different way of looking at the world. Look at, it, look at the way you sleep, the way you move, the way you manage your stress, and a way to help yourself with your condition or symptoms long term. Thank you, I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Byron. He's gonna get into the nitty gritty. I had the fun part of just some fun stuff we get to talk about, so come on up. Hello again, everyone. I am Dr. Rudy Byron, and I'm the physician here at Byron Health and Healing Center. Uh, it's an integrative medical practice. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, I've been practicing integrative medicine now for about six years. Uh, prior to that, practiced as a traditional physician uh, for about 12 years. And <clears throat> our, our talk tonight, of course, is uh, centered around anxiety. Uh, anxiety, as you know, is a very common symptom in our society. It's extremely common. It's one of the most common symptoms that I see in my practice. So uh, this discussion is very much necessary for us. As a matter of fact, we all, we have a huddle, myself, Dr. Brown and Dr. Farr, huddle up at the beginning of the year to discuss uh, what we're going to talk about. And primarily those, those discussions, or the subjects I should say, stem from uh, what our patients come in with and and anxiety was literally the first subject that we thought of that that we would agree upon to talk about first because in fact it's probably the most common symptom that exists uh, I would say that's number one and number two is probably cough and colds right mm -hmm. uh, among among many other things of course in our practices 
Uh, so anxiety is, is front and center for everyone uh, in this room and in our society. Well, <clears throat> anxiety, Dr. Farr uh, talked a bit about the uh, definition of anxiety. Essentially, anxiety is a mood disorder that is a, is a response to something. Our body is responding to something. So it's important for us to listen. What is our, our body responding to? Uh, when we're driving a car and the engine light comes on, how many people ignore it, right? We're not supposed to ignore that. We don't just put tape over the warning light for the engine in the car and keep driving. We actually stop, look, and listen, right? Say, hmm, do I hear any noises or sounds under the, under the hood? Uh, are the brakes working? Is the car starting right? Do I have enough gas, etc.? Anxiety is real. It, it, it's our body's way of speaking to us. There are books written about love languages, right? The love language. Well, what, what, how does our body speak to us? It speaks to us through our senses and our feelings. It's important for us to pay attention to those. Our body is always right. It will never guide us in the wrong direction. We may not want to listen to it, but we should definitely pay attention. <clears throat> the, th this talk tonight, really, this presentation is really about the quote unquote human perspective on this, uh, on this subject. Um, <clears throat> mood disorders, of course, such as anxiety, have a direct impact on our behavior. Uh, it causes us to feel impulsive, causes us to feel scared. As Dr. Dr. Farr mentioned earlier, it affects our gut, right? When we're, when we're anxious, our body could care less about digesting our food. In fact, we typically cannot digest our food, right? We walk around with a knot type feeling in our stomach. Saying, oh, no, no, no thanks for that, that meal. I'm going to pass on that. Mm -hmm. It affects our cognition, our brain function. And many of us will come to the doctor and say, oh, Dr. Byron, I'm having brain fog, right? Say, I can't concentrate. So anxiety is literally front and center for us. Once again, it's an extremely common uh, complaint in the office. When we talk about the human perspective here of anxiety, let's look at, look at this from the perspective of our physical being, the physical human being. There are particular glands and organs that express anxiety very well and are kind of the chiefs of the, of the expression of anxiety for us, the chiefs to make sure that warning light is lit for us on our quote unquote human dashboard. And what are those organs and glands? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna choose just a couple tonight. The first organ is, first, firstly, we'll talk about a gland, special gland that uh, has, a, has a very important role with respect to uh, anxiety. That gland is the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is called the gland of our emotions. And when we talk about emotions, we're talking about E dash motion. Everybody say it with me. E dash motion. That's energy in motion. Energy in motion. Our bodies are in part electrical beings. We're, we're in part electrical beings. Therefore, we need energy, we need electricity. If the voltage is low in our bodies, our body will sound the alarm. The engine light will come on. If our body has too much voltage, if there's a power surge, again, the engine light will come on and say, okay, yep, maybe we ought to go to the uh, car dealer and have them take a, take a look at this. The thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a gland that's located in our neck. And it looks like a butterfly, right? Flies like a butterfly, stings like a bee, right? Butterfly. When a butterfly is flapping its wings just right, that butterfly is gracefully moving throughout its environment. The butterfly is very slow and sluggish. We might say that butterfly is sick. A butterfly, when it has a slow motion, that's indicative of quote unquote hypothyroidism, sluggish thyroid, low voltage, not enough thyroid electric, electrical energy, thyroid hormone electrical energy being transmitted throughout the body. The body will then say, hey, 
We don't like this feeling. That's like the car not having enough voltage. The car is going to knock. It's going to shake a little bit. Not enough electricity. What do we do? We press on the gas pedal a little bit. We say, let's give it some more gas, right? Our body is sending us a signal. Our body will say, oh, I'm anxious. I'm anxious. Some, why am I anxious? Perhaps it's because I don't have enough energy. Thyroid gland, again, looks like what again? A butterfly. It's located in our neck. There, there are a special butterfly called the monarch butterfly, correct? Monarch butterfly. How many people know about monarch butterflies? They're large butterflies, very, very beautiful. How many people know they're in the midst of potentially becoming extinct? They're potentially becoming extinct. Why? Anybody know? Pesticides. Pesticides. That's exactly right. They're, they, they live, their environment, their primary environment is the milkweed tree. The milk, I shouldn't say tree, but the milkweed. And milkweed is dying. Why is milkweed dying? Because of chemicals, pesticides, harmful pesticides and chemicals that are unfortunately affecting the monarch butterfly's environment, living environment. Well, again, our thyroid gland is, what do we say, the gland of our emotions. It looks just like a butterfly. And in fact, it is susceptible to harmful chemicals. Why? Our thyroid gland is a reservoir of electricity. It holds electricity. It stores electricity here. That means it has a highly negative charge. Negative in this term means positive, okay? Like, like negative means good, I should say. So it holds a lot of electricity here. Negative charge attracts what kind of charge? Positive. Negative charge attracts positive charges. 99% of these toxins, pesticides, herbicides, environmental toxins, toxic heavy metals, etc., are positively charged. That's why if we get exposed to radiation, what's the first gland to go? The thyroid gland, right? Because the thyroid gland is literally absorbing these toxins. And the thyroid gland absorbs these toxins, it sends us a signal. It's not gonna just sit back and take it. It's gonna send us a signal. Our voltage will go down and the dashboard light comes on, says, hey, I'm anxious, something's wrong. You better, I'm, I, I don't feel good, I can't sleep, I can't eat. I start gaining weight because I'm not, I don't have enough energy in motion throughout the body. Got it? So my emotions become affected. Understood? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, there is a particular organ that is the chief of our emotions. There's a particular organ that is the chief of our emotions. We talked about a gland that is the chief of our emotions. There's an organ, a corollary organ, that plays that role in the body. Anybody know what that organ is? Want to take a guess? Brain. The, I didn't hear that. The brain. The brain, very good guess. However, eh. <laughs> the organ is the liver. The organ is the liver. I'm surprised no one said the heart, right? Emotions, energy <laughs> in motion. But guess what? The liver's job is to protect the? Heart. It's his primary chief job to protect the heart. The liver. The liver. What's the root word of liver? That shouldn't be too hard. Say it, say it together. Live. Live. Very good. How do we know we are alive? How do we know we're living? Because we sense that we have a life. We're breathing. We can touch, feel. Understood. We sense, we have these senses that we are in fact Livering, okay? We're living. We have that sense, we have sensations. The liver literally has its own personality and it will speak to us. It will say, hey, this is what's going on. That's what's going on. The liver, <clears throat> what's special about the liver? The liver is a reservoir for especially our negative emotions. It holds positive emotions too, but it's especially important to know that it's the seat of our negative emotions. So some of those negative emotions that Dr. Farr mentioned, such as fear, worry, impulsivity, phobias, they get stored in the liver. The liver will hold them. Why? Because the liver is the number one organ of detoxification in the body. 
And it's not just detoxifying physical substances. It detoxifies and or stores or holds negative emotions as well. And that's important to understand because when we're, for example, going through a quote unquote detox, detoxification, many of us would begin to feel things that would say, oh my gosh, where the heck did that come from? I haven't felt that in a long time. Where this headache, this headache is occurring. What the heck is going on? And, and we, we may sometimes get angry, be short tempered with people, feel irritable, etc. That's because the liver is releasing a lot of these negative emotions as we undergo what we think is a physical detox to clean us out. <clears throat> when the liver gets exposed to quote unquote toxins and or, um, and or emotional negative energy, the liver will do its best. It's going to do its best to either detoxify it if it can or if the liver gets tired because we've been eating too much junk in the trunk liver says I've had enough. Liver has a best friend. Its best friend is exactly what Dr. Tara told you it was and that it, liver, the liver's best friend is the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands. So when the liver is struggling, when we're exposed to really significant stressors and liver sends out a signal for anxiety, says hey you can get, you know, Get, get Dr. Byron anxious about this situation. There's a saber-toothed tiger chasing him. He, he shouldn't just be up here chilling, right? Eating bonbons. Get him stressed. Get him moving, okay? The, the liver will then call upon its buddy, the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands will send adrenaline to the liver to sop up any of that extra stress that the liver couldn't handle. Why, why would the liver do that? Why would the liver call upon help from the adrenal glands to send adrenaline in that scenario? Because we have to protect the heart and the brain from junk in the trunk. The body will do any and everything it can to support us, to keep us going, to keep us alive, so that we can fulfill the purposes for which we are presently here on this planet. So it's important to understand that <clears throat> These organs are working in tandem. These, these organs and, and glands are working in tandem to try to keep us healthy, to keep our heart uh, functioning fully. And they will continue to send signals to us to say, hey, something's up. What are some of these uh, quote unquote toxins that can have a direct impact on the liver? Liver gets tired because it's, it's constantly detoxifying, right? It has, it has to detoxify food, environmental toxins, household cleaning agents, uh, you know, air, poor air, driving behind a, a semi-diesel truck that's spewing out, you know, this black smoke. So <clears throat> one of the most common toxins that I see in the office, extremely common, that has a direct impact on anxiety is copper toxicity. That is an excessive amount, high amount of copper. Most people have never heard of that before. How many people have heard of copper toxicity? Very good, about half the, half the hands came up in this room. That is, that is by far and away one of the most common reasons I see for anxiety in my office. What, what's the deal with copper? Copper is a mineral, it's a metal that, is, that comes from the earth. Our body needs copper to utilize for the conduction of electricity. Just like we have copper wire coming out of these electrical cords, copper wire is conducting electricity to our electronic devices, giving us power, correct? Our body uses copper in the same way, to conduct energy. Again, conducting energy. Because we need that copper, it's stored where? In the liver. Again, the all-important liver. If, for many reasons, we get too much copper stored in the body, and there are many reasons for that, if we get too much copper stored in the body, that copper will leak out. Either our body says, hey, you got to go, so we're going to try to detox it out. Copper typically goes out through our bowels, in the urine, and or hair or skin. If our body is not able to detoxify very well because we're under quote unquote stress, then the body shuts down the process of detoxification and causes that copper to go deep. It will dive deep into tissues and it will stay there 
But does our body like extra copper floating around? No. If we put extra copper in that cord that goes to our electronic devices, such as our cool iPads and iPhones, what happens to that computer or that phone when we turn it on with extra copper wire in there? It blows up, right? It'll short circuit. That's exactly what it does in our bodies. It goes to special tissues and special organs and literally blows them up. Copper is a conductor of what? Electricity. So it likes highly electrical places in the body, specifically places like the brain, the guts, among many other places, including female organs, which we're not going to talk about today. We'll save that for another lecture. The, the point here is that copper is feminine. Copper is a feminine mineral. Are females more emotional than men? Yes. So a woman will come in and say, Dr. Byron, I don't know what's going on, but this PMS, my husband just says, you know, I got I to go see somebody. So I'm coming to see you, Dr. B. Anxiety, nervousness, copper is stimulating. Too much electrical power surge going to the emotional centers of the body. Boom. People blow up, men and women, by the way. I didn't mean to pick, just pick on our ladies. So copper toxicity is a major, major source that most people are not familiar with. It's very common and very easily treated and addressed. The other toxins, other toxins, remember, where is copper stored again? Liver. The liver, which means we really must take care of our what? Liver. liver. You, if, if you are anxious, if you're anxious or you know somebody who's anxious, think, number one, cleanse the liver. Focus on the liver. Speak to the liver. The liver has a mind all its own. It talks to you all the time. Talk back to it. Say, liver, I love you. Thank you so much, liver, for, for assisting me to live my best life. And the liver will appreciate you for it. It's going to work harder. Give the liver what it wants. It needs love. And we're going to talk about some of those things at the end. In addition, other toxins that cause the liver to have to work hard, ultimately le leading to significant symptoms of anxiety. Mercury, high on the list. Very, very high on the list. When we look at professions that have a high depression rate and a high suicide rate, what's the number one profession? Dentistry. Why? Because they make dental amalgams out of mercury, right? It's a large portion of the dental amalgam, dental fillings we're referring to. Mercury is a major, major toxin. Most people do not know that it's extremely common. Everybody in this room has a significant amount of mercury. Again, where is much of that mercury sitting? In our livers in our livers, and there was someone in the, in the uh, uh, crowd here, our large 50,000 seated <laughs> arena, who shouted out liver, I mean, the uh, mercury is, is, is uh, in the teeth, and she's exactly right, yes, it's in the teeth and the dental fillings, among many other places. Um, and there are many, many, many ways to get exposed to mercury. Remember the old felt hats, right? The old felt hats uh, back in the day, 1800s. <laughs> They're, oh, you guys don't remember that? Come on. <laughs> Belt hats. So these hats they used to wear, and they made, you know, they have the brim on them. Uh, they made them with uh, a lining specifically that uh, led to those people going mad, and they called them mad hatters. And they were mad hatters because there was mercury lining those hats, those quote-unquote brims, and it led them to go crazy. They became significant, they developed significant anxiety, uh, depression, among other things. The mad hatters. Mm -hmm. The liver is extremely important. There are other, there are other quote unquote agents that have an impact on the liver leading to substantial anxiety that most people are not familiar with. And that would be infectious agents. Infectious agents, such as viruses. Which virus absolutely loves the liver? That's his primary home and it's in just about everybody's liver here. That agent is Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus, everybody's been exposed. Everybody has it. And if our immune systems are strong enough, then we're good. We can suppress it. However, 
Epstein Barr is just sitting there waiting in the cup for a stressful situation to occur and it will start wreaking havoc. And the liver must keep it in check. The liver must keep it in check. If the liver doesn't, can't keep it in check, what will the liver do? It will call upon his buddy, adrenaline to come, and sop it up, slap it around a little bit. If, there's, if, if the adrenal glands are weak because we've been chronically stressed for a long time, the liver says, okay, going to increase fat. The liver's just going to develop more fat around it called fatty liver, okay? And why would, it, why would the liver develop fat? Why would, why, would that, why would that occur? Because as Dr. Tara said, one of fat's function is to store toxins. So the liver gets fat, it says, okay, I'm just gonna put this EBV, Epstein-Barr virus here, I'm gonna throw some mercury in there, I'm gonna throw some dioxin in there, I'm gonna throw some copper in there, okay? The liver's like, hey, I'm, out, I'm, all out of, I'm all out of what I can do here. Can't continue to detoxify this because this guy's over here drinking too much. This guy, this, guy's, this guy has too much debt. This guy is working, you know, 80 hours a week, right? So now our body's been telling us, because we're anxious, our body's been telling us, hey, slow down, get some rest, get out of that debt. Do you understand? But instead, we're like, nope, got to go, got to go, got to go, got to go. So it's very, very important. If you don't take care of your liver, what happens? It shrinks. It gets fat and it shrinks and then it's a wrap. And we said the liver, what's the, what's the root word of liver? Live. To live. If the liver's not functioning, then we all know what happens. It's a wrap. The liver holds our negative emotions, as we, as we talked about earlier. Remember? When the liver says, all right, I quit, I'm done, and the patient's struggling, and they're blessed enough to get a liver transplant, what happens? What happens? Every single patient with a liver transplant has some aspect of their personality change. Every single one of them has an aspect of their personality that changes. Why? Because those emotions from that other liver get transferred to the new person. Wow. Do you understand mm -hmm. the importance, the need to make sure that we're doing these things that Dr. Tara mentioned? Resting, meditation, living a clean lifestyle. It's extremely important. It, it, otherwise, our body is telling us that anxiety, do not ignore it. Do not ignore the, the engine light. It's one of the most common symptoms that exist in any of our doctor's offices. There's a condition, when the liver says, I'm done, there's a condition. Everyone, if you have a pen, otherwise put it to memory, there's a condition called NASH, N-A-S-H, NASH. And you'll have to write this down because it's a scientific term. NASH is an acronym for non steato I'm sorry, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Non-alcoholic steato, S-T-E-A-T-O, hepatitis. So right away, we see itis in there for the liver, right? So inflammation of the liver. Inflammation of the liver. What does steato mean? Fatty. Fatty liver, right away. Non-alcoholic means what? It's not from drinking, alcohol. 30 million people have that condition. Most don't know. 90% of them don't know. 30 million people. I didn't say 300, I didn't say 3,000, I didn't say 300,000. I said 30 million. That is, that is a condition that leads to end-stage liver disease. End-stage liver disease means that it quits, okay? When we talk about anxiety, anxiety is an early sign that the liver is under stress or duress. Pay attention to anxiety and seek the root cause. Do not just put tape over the engine warning light. Putting tape over the engine warning light is like saying, here, let me pull out my prescription pad and take this Xanax. Sometimes we need the Xanax, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you need that, but if you stop there, eventually the engine will fail because it was not attended to. 
Medication we need sometimes. Uh, don't get me wrong. Remember, I'm, I'm an MD. I pull out the prescription, prescription pad occasionally because sometimes people need the support. So don't get me wrong, but some of that medication is very dangerous. Some of that tape you put over and you can't see the engine light and it's tape that completely covers that red light and you just kind of ignore it, person will get hooked on it. They're like, I'm depending on this, on this car to get me to work and I, I'm just going to keep going and ignore this, this engine light and a person will get hooked on the medication, right? They get hooked on the medication. Now let's go to part B, anxiety. Part B, they get hooked on medication such as Xanax, et cetera. I was the medical director of a behavioral health clinic for several years, for two years, actually three, for three years. These patients were hooked on medications like Xanax, for example, or clonazepam, et cetera. They were out there partying with it or abusing it and they would end up being forced to come to the clinic for many other reasons, whether it was because they, they had to do it to keep their job or, or the judicial system got in the way and said, hey, you better do this or it's jail time, et cetera. So now as a physician, I couldn't prescribe that medication. So what did I prescribe? What would physicians do in that scenario? Okay, Use alternative medications for anxiety. Again, all we're doing is putting a patch putting a patch on, giving them a patch, correct? But, in the, but you gotta do something, because they're seriously anxious, cannot function, it adversely affects activities of daily living. What will we do? We, one of the options we have is to give them an antihistamine. Give them an antihistamine medication. What does histamine have to do with anxiety? Anybody know? What does histamine have to do with anxiety? What do we know about histamine? During the elbow season, spring and fall, you may see many people doing what? <laughs> Coughing, sniffing, sneezing from what? Seasonal allergies. allergies, seasonal allergies. What happens to histamine during that time? Histamine increases during that time. And we say, oh, you just take what? What do you take? An antihistamine. What, what's anti, which antihistamine would people typically take? Benadryl, right, among others, okay? Histamine, and we just say, yeah, we just kind of go with the flow, take an antihistamine and don't really think, what is histamine, okay? Histamine is a neurotransmitter, neuro nerve transmitter messenger. So tr it's a messenger for our nervous system. Histamine is a neurotransmitter. It is a messenger for our nervous system. So if histamine goes up, what happens? The nervous system, what happens to the nervous system? It gets stimulated. It's a stimulator for our nervous system. If histamine goes up really high, what happens? It gets really stimulated. A person will get super anxious. As a matter of fact, they can get paranoid, okay? When you take Benadryl, how do you feel? You feel super awake or, or you feel what? Drowsy. So what does it do? Calm you down. You get that histamine down, it calms you down. Now, what is the classic symptom of somebody who has allergy symptoms? It's a classic symptom. Classic. Nasal, correct. And what about nasal? Be more descriptive. Nasal what? Nasal drip, nasal drainage, what do we call that? Runny mucus, runny nose, mucus, right? So when histamine goes up, it does what to mucus? It increases mucus, right? It increases mucus. What does that have to do with anything? What does it have to do with anything? It increases mucus. If I spill a bottle of ketchup on a white, pristine marble floor, I need to clean that up. Okay, I'm clumsy, I need to clean up that ketchup I just spilled on this white marble floor. First thing I'm gonna do is get a mop. And I'm gonna do what with the mop? Okay. Wet it. I'm gonna wet the mop, that's mucus. You're wetting something, okay? You're wetting something. Number two, if I clean that wet, if I use that wet mop alone to clean the ketchup on the white pristine floor, will it fully clean that floor? No, everybody said no and they're 100% correct. What do you need to add to the mop? You need to add, right, a cleanser, correct? You have to add a cleanser to clean that up. 
when mucus drips down in your mouth, and don't tell me it's never dripped down in your mouth and you've never tasted it. When it drips down in your mouth, what does it taste like? It tastes salty. It tastes salty. Why would the body use histamine to increase mucus and add some salt to it? Remember, we're 70% salt water. We're 70% salt water, so the body will draw upon our own natural salt, add some mucus to it to clean junk in the trunk, to clean toxins, to detoxify. If you have an allergy, you got a toxin. If we're anxious, the body will increase histamine to try to mop up the place, clean it up, because we don't have enough key nutrients and protectors to do the job. So the body has to revert to using mucus through histamine. And histamine, our body's trying to help us out, but it's going to use this histamine to <clears throat> stimulate the nervous system, which subsequently leads to what? Symptom? Anxiety. Patient walks in the office, Dr. Byron, I'm so nervous, I don't know what to do, I can't even sleep. Da 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 da. And they're talking fast and they're, you know, fidgeting and, and they're talking about this, that, and the other all at the same time. How many times that happened in your office, right? Five times a day. Right, five times a day. That's exactly right. And we wonder what's going on. We have to listen. Stop, look, and listen to the body. Sit back and say, what is in my environment? What am I putting in my body? Talk to the liver. Ask the liver to reveal what's going on. The liver will talk to you. It will reveal it. <clears throat> I was eating gluten-free waffle in my home a couple years ago, eating gluten-free waffle. And I noticed that, I shouldn't say I noticed, I'm the first one awake in my house, I'm in the, in the kitchen, preparing breakfast, having a gluten-free waffle, among other things. Of course, I have my cooked veggies going. Everybody should know that. I got the cooked veggies going, too. So having my gluten-free waffle. So I'm making the mix, and I noticed, actually, I didn't notice, my wife said, hey, she doesn't call me Dr. B at home, but she says, hey, Dr. B. Uh, you, did you know you're coughing in the morning? And I'm a typical guy. What do I say? Of course not. Deny, right? I'm like, no, I'm not coughing. What are you talking about? Next morning, <coughs> like, oh my gosh, she's right. I'm coughing. So I noticed that when I got near the waffle maker, I would cough. I, there wouldn't even be any batter in the waffle maker, but I would cough right there. Now, I could ignore that. I could say, oh, I'm just, it's nothing. But I'm very perceptive. I said, something's up. Something's up with this waffle maker. It must be the waffle mix. So I said, looked at the waffle mix. It's organic, gluten-free, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hmm, I can't figure this out. So I called upon one of my colleagues, had one of my colleagues take a look. And she said, oh, Dr. Byron, come on. Why are you really here? This is too easy. It was the buttermilk. It was the buttermilk. My body was very sensitive to the buttermilk. I was coughing. Okay. So what did I do? Get the gluten-free, dairy-free version. And guess what? I could enjoy my waffle. <laughs> my body was talking to me. It was giving me a signal specifically to say, hey, stop, look, and listen. Pay attention so that I don't keep asking my liver to do the work. You understand, my liver had to break down that buttermilk and it was not happy. I said, that's enough, enough's enough, Dr. B. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you cough, okay? And instead of just taking a cough medicine or taking a quote unquote supplement for it, I looked for the source, okay? I didn't just say, okay, here, here we go, let's fit, let's, let me take, let me, you know, um, yeah, anyway, I better stop. Keep, keep it moving, keep it moving, Dr. B. <laughs> okay, let's transition to Let's transition to what can we do? What can we do about this anxiety? So there's a lot of this talk about, you know, breathing well, uh, listening to our bodies, working on detoxification. What can we do? So there are lots of things, lots of easy things. In my office, I like to say, press the easy button. Press the easy button. What are some easy things we can do? Dr. Tara mentioned several of those. Take deep breaths. Slow down. Pay attention. Live a detoxification lifestyle. You must always be in the mode of 
eating cleanly, having clean household environment, paying special attention to the music you're listening to. My daughter reminds me of that all the time because I'm from the old school hip hop era. She's like, Dr. Byron, you got to turn that. Dr. She's calling me Dr. B. Poppy, you got to turn that off. I'm like, come on now. <laughs> Thank God for her, because otherwise my liver would be pissed. <laughs> Many people ask me in the office, I, I probably get this question once every two to three days, because anxiety is so common and so prevalent, they ask me, what about CBD oil? How many people have heard of CBD oil? Right? Just about all the hands come up, raise up in the room. And CBD oil is relatively new, uh, relatively new, uh, quote unquote, potential healing remedy. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm gonna say about that uh, is that CBD oil definitely has some benefits for anxiety, definitely. One of the ways that it works is it works as, and by the way, CBD oil, for those of you who may not know, is uh, it, in, the, in the US at least, it's legal from the hemp plant. Mm -hmm. So it's the plant that, uh, it's a cousin of, mar of the marijuana plant that specifically produces something called CBD oil, cannabidiol oil. And that's one tiny component of the many components, chemical or phyto chemical plant components in that particular plant. Uh, and so CBD oil has been found to uh, help regulate the body's emotional responses and it acts as an adaptogen. So it has adaptogenic effects, which means that if our body needs to be stimulated, it'll stimulate the emotions. If the emotions are heightened already and we're coming to the doctor complaining of anxiety, it will calm them down. So CBD oil has that kind of power. It's, a, it's what I call a smart plant, or some people will say a smart herb. Uh, you really can't mess it up. But I want to say a couple important things about CBD oil because many people are using it uh, without having a full understanding of some other aspects. So CBD oil, one very important thing to know is that the hemp plant specifically is a bioaccumulator of toxins. That's what it does in nature. It grabs onto toxins. So what most people don't know is that CBD oil has a massive amount of toxins already. So if you're going to embark upon using CBD oil, you must be assured that it has been tested and or purified from any toxins. That's extremely important. Otherwise, for example, in my office, I'm not saying this because I read it on somebody's website or on somebody's blog. I see it in the office because I test for it. So you'll see super duper high levels of aluminum, for example. You'll see massively high levels of cadmium. And there it is right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've been on CBD oil for the last four years. You know, da, 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 the cadmium's through the roof. CBD oil, tobacco, for example, uh, uh, hemp plant, super high in cadmium, super high in aluminum, among other toxins. Remember, in nature, that's what it does. In the soil, you got a uh, <coughs> marijuana plant or a uh, CBD, or I'm sorry, a hemp plant. Uh, that's what it does. It bioaccumulates. It will... It will magnetically attract the toxins so that you can have good quality food around that. Got it? So do your homework on that. Do not just go for the okie doke. Just take somebody's random CBD oil supplement. But it is, I do want to say that it is very good and it's a, it's a reasonably good option when you're using a good product. Uh, a couple of other things uh, regarding beneficial ways to, ways to improve anxiety. Many people are familiar with some key nutrients, key minerals, such as magnesium, right? Magnesium is excellent. Uh, magnesium, magnesium has a calming effect on the body. So if you make a muscle, that's calcium. Relax the muscle, that's magnesium. Got it? Contract, calcium, relax, magnesium. For those of you who are old enough, you remember the old school commercial, Calgon, take me away, right? That's, that's magnesium. That's magnesium doing its best work. Epsom salt baths, right? Very calming, soothing. That's magnesium. 
Okay? So magnesium can be beneficial. It's not as precise as you think, though. Some people, quite frankly, after testing in my office, it's revealed that it's not magnesium they need. They actually need calcium. Calcium actually has somewhat of a calming effect as well. Uh, but sometimes you just don't know if you don't have a, if you don't know, if you don't have any testing available, at least try some magnesium. Typically, it won't hurt you in most cases. Um, and, it's and especially taking it at night before bedtime. Other things, other things, uh, some key, key nutrients. Number one, stress nutrient that in my office, 98% of people are low, but the data will tell you that 80% of Americans are low. I can tell you I've tested for the last six years, 98% of people, in fact, I really want to say 99% because there are only three people in the last six years who've had a normal level who weren't already supplementing. And that is which, which vitamin? I'm sorry, which mineral? Manganese. Zinc. Zinc. That was a good guess. Zinc, zinc. So for the most part, that zinc responds to stress. It's especially important for the adrenal glands. It's especially important for the adrenal glands, especially important for the liver. And then you ask, glad you asked this question, of course, which foods are high in zinc, right? Mm -hmm. Meat, <clears throat> meat, uh, seafood, be careful with seafood because seafood contains quite a few toxins as well, so you gotta proceed with caution there. But meat does. It doesn't mean you have to be a carnivore, for example, but just I'm just it's more for sharing information. Um, you don't get a lot of zinc in plant products. Uh, next, we talked about magnesium, zinc, calcium, oils, oils, essential oils. Uh, essential oils these days, in my opinion, because of the changes that we're seeing in our environment, essential oils are literally coming to the fore for us. They are a gift to us. They are a gift to help us deal with all this quote unquote stress. I use oils literally every day, multiple times a day, including on my way to work and on my way home. Oils are very, very beneficial for us, whether, you, whether they're used as simply something that's fun or uh, for therapeutic purposes, uh, I think that in fact they are essential, especially for the rise in uh, problematic conditions that we see in our environment. So they're really there to help us. So we should really become familiar. I like to say, get familiar with the oils. Uh, which oils will we use? Essential oils will we use to keep us in chill mode, calming? Lavender among, among many, right? Lavender is very good, and there, there are many others. Uh, but lavender would, buy, be far and, would be by far and away uh, number one. Uh, there, are also, there are also oils that have, quote unquote, adaptogenic properties, meaning you can't go wrong. They're like CBD oil if, if you had pure CBD oil uh, or purified CBD oil. Uh, there are some oils that function that way, such as copaiba, among others. Copaiba actually has some CBD in it. Uh, and again, if you use that from the perspective of a company that offers pure essential oils, then you're good. That's another great way to utilize oils to assist in this process of dealing with anxiety. These are all practical things that you can do to allow your body to send it messages. That body gets some lavender in it. You're sending that liver some love. You're like, yeah, that liver's like, give me some more. Sound like James Brown. <laughs> The, see, some, some people, I must be getting old or something, you know. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> obviously, last but not least, with anxiety, either minimizing and or avoiding alcohol. Remember, alcohol is a toxin, uh, and it is a what? Depressant. So uh, excessive alcohol can be very problematic. Uh, the liver has to detoxify it. Uh, you often see this, believe it or not. Remember, the liver is the seat of our negative emotions, right? So what happens? What happens? Person drinks, you'll see some people who get what? Angry. They get aggressive. They want to fight, right? That's the liver, the liver speaking. It's the liver, all, the, all of the uh, uh, ways that the liver has been suppressed are now coming out because the alcohol numbs the nerves. So now it just starts talking, screaming. The... Um, <clears throat> Avoid the excessive stimulants as well. So 
uh, you know, excessive coffee. Um, you know, when I worked for that behavioral health program for three years, nearly every single person either came in with a big coffee mug or uh, Mountain Dew. If they didn't smoke, they needed a stimulant, they weren't smoking, if they didn't have a coffee mug, if they did not have uh, a Mountain Dew on the desk, they probably did not belong in the program. And what, what, what are they really telling me? What is their body telling me when they're bringing that stuff in? That they're low in what? Energy. And that low energy is expressed as an emotion, energy in motion, okay? So if they were seeing me at Byron Health and Healing Clinic, my job would be to focus on assisting the process of detoxification with the central theme of cleansing the liver, liver subsequently boosting their energy centers, adrenals and thyroid. Got it? That's the ticket. That's the home run hitter right there. So again, anxiety is extremely common. Have to use tools that are very well available to us. Do not ignore your body. Stop look and listen and last but not least there are a couple things on the uh, table on the side there that we use in our practice uh, very frequently um, one is called Zendocrine that's a doTERRA product that's a great product for uh, liver support I always 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 have 100% of my patients on some, on, excuse me, on some form of liver support uh, and there are other, other things. E-liver is excellent as well. Uh, that's another uh, product. That's a Byron Health and Healing specific product. That's extremely good. Which reminds me, another source of anxiety that we did not talk about today. We're not going to talk about it at any length, but I just want to share that it is important for us, and that is EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies. Okay? That's another major, major toxin that's relatively new to us over the last know 15 to 20 years that's increasingly becoming worse and our body has to deal with that so again we're not going to talk about it now but again what can you do you got to you got to develop some protective barriers to assist your body to address that um, <clears throat> there's a bottle of lavender over there as well uh, I think I don't know what we were diffusing tonight uh, so um, that is the ticket I don't think I have anything else uh, to discuss. So thank you for your attention, uh, especially with the with a subject such as anxiety. I mean, you know, it could kind of be a Debbie Downer type of subject, but, um, you know, I get excited about that subject because there are easy tools to use to fix it. None of us should walk around with any significant anxiety. It's too easy to address if we do really simple things. Stop looking, listen to your body, and and use some of these tools that we have readily available the, the vast majority of which are, are extremely inexpensive, some of which are free. That's it. Thank you. And Thank you. You're welcome. And go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, we, 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 we're open for questions. Yes. So, so That's what I was going to say too, Dr. Brown. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, so with adrenal fatigue, um, I'm trying to get myself on like a regular schedule, like when I wake up at eight o'clock and everything, but because if I don't sleep well, um, or I go bed go to bed too late, then I feel like I can't I feel like I shouldn't wait force my body to get up at that time and create that routine. Should I just force myself to do it, push past it, or should I be like listening to my body and getting to sleep and sleep until ten thirty instead? Like what's the recommendation for that? <laughs> Very good. Uh, I like to say, at least from my response, Dr. Terra, is to go with the flow. If, you're, if your body is calling upon the need for more rest, you need more rest. Do not force it. Listen to your body. Your body's saying, get the rest, take the rest so that you can heal. Mm -hmm. That's extremely Sleep important. Sleep is a time of mm -hmm. healing and rejuvenation. So if our body is saying we're tired, we need to sleep more, you got to listen to it and because it's saying what it needs in that moment so i would take definitely take more time to let your body heal in that time so. I wanted to add something too uh you reminded me about the importance of the cycle for the liver you know a, a women have a menstrual cycle right all men have a cycle mm -hmm. everybody has a cycle the liver has a cycle so all of our organs and glands have a cycle 
the liver's time, the liver has a time in which it sings. It does its best work between 1 and 3 a.m. So if you're waking up between 1 and 3 a.m., again, stop, look, and listen. Say, hmm, am I, am I detoxing something extra and or do I have some emotion that I'm not, a, that I'm not addressing, such as resentment, anger, frustration? That's liver time. Mm -hmm. We live near Milwaukee with Miller time. No, no, no. It's liver time. <laughs> liver we just time. got a jokester over here today. Okay. Okay. Hey, you gotta, you gotta bring your A game when we talk about anxiety, right? You don't want you don't want to hear Debbie Downer talk, right? And I this hear that multiple times a day is I can't sleep and I say, Well what time did you have tr trouble going to sleep? And they say, No, I can fall asleep fine. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, Well what time do you wake up? And most people will tell me between one and three AM. So and then I say, That's your liver. Yes. You need to work on your liver. Yes. So mm. questions? Go ahead. So I, I was just gonna ask the question of the, um, the time of That's a great question. What, are, what, are, what is the best time to eat a meal? Best time to eat a meal technically is between 5 and 7. Mm -hmm. 5 and 7 p.m., which is relatively early for many of us. Yes. Uh, in my world, that's definitely early. Yeah. Uh, but that's the best time to eat because you need time for the food to digest before you go to bed. You really go to bed between 8.30 and 10.30. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if, you, if you're not eating until 8 o'clock at night, that's not enough time for the food to digest, subsequently food will sit, it will sit. Yeah, and so. then I also see with people who eat later meals, they wake up in the middle of the night because their <coughs> blood sugar will spike. So that's another reason why I see patients waking up is because of their blood sugar mm -hmm. and the time they're eating and when that, that sugar's released, it will wake them up in the middle of the night too. And the adrenals response to that because we know sugar increases in the body, the adrenal glands are gonna respond to that too. So we wake up in a state of adrenaline, so. You had a question? Okay. I, uh, you mentioned that most people are tired with caffeine or you know, coffee, like Mountain Dew and stuff like that. What would be something you would suggest that a regular person can do to get energy? Because I think that's an epidemic. We're all tired. And most of us, not enough sleep. But does food also have something to do? Is there a body that is tired because we're full of toxins? Or are they things we should avoid eating? You can go first. Okay. <laughs> um, good question. So she 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 was saying, um, are there certain? What was it? So how did you say that again? Sorry, I'm like. It's okay. They'll, since there's like a epidemic of tiredness. Oh, fatigue. That's yeah, what, fatigue. That's, yes. You asked multiple questions. So it's, Sorry. <laughs> so she's saying everybody's tired all the time. We say to avoid stimulants like sugar and soda. How can we keep on going and surviving? You know. Um, without these stimulants that we say to avoid, but not just be fatigued all day long. Well, one thing is cleaning that liver, more detoxification, if we clean that liver out, we're gonna sh have more energy, and more mental clarity, and our, ener like our whole energy is gonna improve when we clean that liver out. And then, um, so foods that we eat that keep, continue to detoxify the body, fruits and vegetables, um, is one thing. And then eating regular, in my, my medical, opinion is eating regular meals throughout the day. So I say eat like a bird. So you're eating breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner to help maintain that blood sugar. Because a lot of the times when our adrenal glands are off and our cortisol is spiking at odd times in the day, usually what happens? We eat lunch, right? We, eat, we wake up, we have energy. We start going in the morning, we eat lunch, and then we get this two o'clock lull, right? Where we're just like, oh my gosh, I need Starbucks, I need sugar, I need something because well, that's an adrenal issue, but if we're eating poor quality foods or our blood sugar is not regulated throughout the day, then that will cause imbalances in that and we'll get that lull in the afternoon where we feel like we need that stimulant. So eating low glycemic foods routinely throughout the day is gonna help maintain that blood sugar. Eating a protein with every meal to help maintain that blood sugar with a good quality fat is gonna help keep your blood sugar so it's not jumping and dropping and jumping, which puts extra stress on our body. So that can give you more energy is just regulating your diet throughout the day cleanly mm -hmm. to help detoxify the body, but also to maintain that blood sugar. Yep, I, I would just second, second that by adding uh, veggies, 
green leafy veggies especially. Remember we get energy from the sun, photosynthesis, right? Mm -hmm. Photosynthesis. So first, first order of business for a plant to grow in these water. So make sure that we're well hydrated. That's, that's the most important aspect when it comes to food. Most of us walk around dehydrated and we have a couple folks in the back who are drinking their big jugs of water. That's, that's the critical piece, staying well hydrated. Number two, these, these vegetables, especially the green leafies, are storing sun energy, right? They're storing sun energy. Guess what? That energy gets incorporated into our bodies, in fact, giving us energy. So uh, eating, eating plenty of uh, green leafies throughout the day, cooked, combination, raw, I make sure that I have some form of vegetables, especially some green leafies, at least twice a day, at least partially for lunch and for sure with dinner. So, uh, and I also have, a, have vegetables for breakfast as well. So I make sure to stay stored up uh, on, on, the, on the sun energy, foods that retain that sun energy. Smoothies are a great way for morning breakfast to get your veggies in. You could throw spinach in there, you know, you can get those veggies in. Um, I make an avocado spinach smoothie and it's awesome. I love it. So. You have a recipe you got posted for that on the site? Oh, I just made it up. Oh. <laughs> but basically, if you all want it, yes. it's like almond or coconut milk, right? And I do like a whole avocado. I do a handful of spinach in there. Um, I do some coconut oil too to get me some fat. And then some honey, some mm. local honey. It kind of gives it a sweetness, but it is like, and then blend it all up. It is so good, I swear. I could eat it every day, mm -hmm. and I do. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I made it up, so I don't, <laughs> there wasn't a recipe I follow. I just made it up. But. Yes. What are some things that one could do to start detoxifying their liver? That's, that's a great question. So our question was, what, what are some of the things that we can do to begin to detoxify our liver? Uh, so number one is the liver requires lots of liquid water. It requires a lot of water because if you're going to clean house, you're going to clean up that ketchup on a pristine white floor, you need water, you need a mop, you need a wet mop. So so you need to stay well hydrated. Uh, those who have uh, been following our presentations over the years, this is now year six, four, four five. five, something like that. All right. yeah, let's call it year five. Uh, those who have been following us know that we almost always mention the amount of water that we need daily. And anyone care to mention how much water we need? Who wants to see my impression of this guy? Go for it. <laughs> so, we are 70% what? Water. Salt water. <laughs> that was um, good. Yeah. Go so ahead. anyway, so our goal is half our, half our body weight in ounces per day minimum for survival, right? If we're physically active and working out and sweating, you need a third more of that. Oh, nice. So whatever you weigh, divide it by two. Out, that's how many ounces a day minimum, wow. right? So That's a lot of water. Some of that is coming through food. Right, mm -hmm. So if you're eating vegetables, they're retaining a lot of fluid. I'm mean, right. sorry, a lot of a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's important. Uh, the other things to do for the liver. So real basic. We'll run through a couple real basic things. Uh, one is very easy, right? We start with the easy and inexpensive stuff. Lemon, lemon water. So mm -hmm. you squirt a little lemon in your water, and/or use lemon essential oil, right? Purify lemon essential oil, or just squirt a lemon and/or lime in the water. The liver loves it. It <laughs> sings. The liver is an organ, right? Organs. You can't play an organ unless it's in tune, right? How do these organs speak to each other? They speak via vibrational frequencies. They speak to each other via vibrational frequencies. If it's not a tune, you're not going to like that sound. It's going to manifest itself as anxiety. So it's important to make sure you're giving the liver what it needs to be in tune. It loves highly alkaline substances because it's always dealing with these acidic substances to try to break down toxins, right? So it loves the alkaline, alkalinity of lemon and or limes. They're the most alkaline fruits that exist. So although we think that they are acidic, right? They have alkaline forming properties once we ingest them. We another, always give cocktail party information. <laughs> another way is we talked about Epsom salt baths, right? Mm -hmm. Epsom salt has magnesium. Magnesium calms the body. It also helps detoxify. So like I always say two cups of Epsom salt in a warm bath, soak for 20 minutes, 
that can help detoxify the body as well. Cocktail party information, you ready? Okay, cocktail party information. Which substance, which nutrient is high in lemon or limes that make them alkaline? Nutrient, vitamin, mineral. CD? Eh, that was a good guess. Potassium, potassium, very high in potassium. So uh, the other things for the liver, uh, some of my favorites, artichoke extract, mm -hmm. milk thistle, dandelion root, yeah. among many others. Right. Zendocrine has many of those already built in it. I, when I first started uh, uh, practicing integrative medicine, one of my mentors, in fact, my primary mentor, uh, sold artichoke extract in his office. And I asked his staff, I said, what's the number one selling uh, supplement in the office? And I assumed he would say something like vitamin C, you know, vitamin E, something like that, magnesium. No, he said, he said artichoke extract. It's like, what? <laughs> artichoke extract. That's because his practice was centered around the same process. Focus on the liver, detoxification, get that liver cleaned up and everything else begins to work better. Everything else is in tune, the symphony of the body, symphony of cells are functioning as one. Got it? Yes. yes. So what happens, um, let's say that someone has been able to overcome anxiety for some time, but they have tingling in the body and like pain in the back of their neck. Like what do you guys recommend for that person? who's trying to eat healthy and who's doing everything that they can to overcome it. So let, just to clarify the question again, you said they have, uh, t they're, they're eating cleanly, live, trying to live a clean lifestyle, yes. Yes. yet they have tingling. persistent symptoms of tingling. And the pain in the back of the neck and kind of like tingling all over the body oh. at different times of the day. At the chiropractor answer. I <laughs> That's what I, I was going to say. <laughs> Um, chiropractic adjustments can help a lot yeah. um, just with the effects of our body's physical stress of everything but specifically adjusting T um, eight, uh, 7 8 in the middle of the back feeds um, the adrenal glands and can help balance the body okay. so and adjusting the upper neck can help too but okay. um, pretty much if there's imbalance in the nervous system and again chiropractically we yeah. work with the brain and the nervous system and the brain talks with everything to communicate function right, right. so if it can't communicate downstream then there's going to be dysfunction in the body so if we create balance through a chiropractic adjustment so that brain can talk to those adrenal glands and everything can communicate freely within the body our body's going to function better right okay. so chiropractic adjustments can help a lot i do i have some of my patients here i feel i, I can just touch their backs and i have to say i had one today a middle middle back it was just like a rock i said man are you stressed she's like it's been a really stressful day and i'm like i can tell like yeah. me just touching your body i can tell yeah. what it, what the issue is okay. you know other issues i treat you know any digestive issue low back i'll find a lot of tension in that low back okay. you know so it's it's a really a cool therapy to use to treat just anxiety but a lot of other things as well okay thank you mm -hmm. Look at, look at uh, B vitamin status too, like vitamin B12, when you got tingling, yeah. that kind of problem, generally speaking, okay. uh, look, at a, look at a B12 level. Okay. Uh, B12 is low, it means stomach acid is likely, highly mm -hmm. likely to be low as well, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are things to do for that. Okay. What vegetables are you eating for breakfast? Great question. Uh, ve veggies I eat for breakfast are... I would say 50% of the time, cruciferous vegetables. So I eat a, a medley of cruciferous vegetables. Broccoli, cauliflower, and then carrots. You, that's not a cruciferous vegetable. It's actually called California blend. That's what I, that's what I eat. <laughs> Organic uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and carrots. Uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do, do that one day. Next day, I'll do green beans. Next day, all organic. Next day, I do uh, broccoli alone. But 50% of the time, it's the, it's the medley. And, and why, why do I actually specifically do that for a reason? Uh, because the cruciferous vegetables are extremely beneficial for cleansing the liver. Mm -hmm. Extremely important for cleansing the liver. They contain a, a compound called endolamine. Endolamine, I-N-D-O-L-A-M-I-N-E. And that specifically breaks down one of the toxins uh, that leads to excessive amounts of estrogen buildup 
let's say from plastics among other things. So it helps to break down uh, toxins that are plastic based, which we're all inundated with. So, uh, so that's that actually. So that's what I what I the veggies. Those are the veggies that I eat in the morning. My daughter, who is who just turned 13, uh, for several years, she's the second one who comes to the kitchen, and she gets her breakfast started, and she makes her own set of veggies. And her veggies usually include sometimes carrots, sometimes broccoli. Those would be the big two for my daughter. Again, teach the family. Teach your kids how to do this independently at very young ages. They will learn how to, how to uh, deal with quote unquote stress and anxiety in part in the kitchen. Kids in the kitchen makes a big difference. So uh, when, you're, when you're, you're get, you get that energy, you absorb that healing energy that's in a carrot, that's in a broccoli, et cetera. You absorb it just by handling it, just by getting the scent from it, et cetera. Yeah. And then you eat it, of course, it's game on. Right. Your liver loves you back. <laughs> Anything besides vegetables for breakfast in the morning? Yes. Gluten-free waffles. My gluten-free, <laughs> my gluten slash dairy-free. Don't forget right. that dairy. Gluten dairy-free waffle and or pancakes. If I make pancakes, then they're, they're blueberries, wild blueberries. Mm -hmm. Wild blueberries are extremely beneficial for the liver, by the way. Okay. Very, very beneficial for the liver. Also great for the eyes as well, specifically for night vision. Excellent. Um, if you want to improve, wild blueberries also have antiviral properties as well. Remember, there's a special virus that likes to hang out in the liver, which is Epstein-Barr Epstein -Barr virus. You were listening tonight. Nobody fell asleep. That's a dream. That is. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about anxiety, you know, oh my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the ticket. Yeah. I usually have a couple of eggs. Yeah. <clears throat> eggs, by the way, I, I should say something about eggs. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, we never saw eggs show up in, I shouldn't say never, but it's very rare to see eggs show up in food sensitivity testing. Now it's extremely common, extremely common. So eggs are not necessarily a food that I highly recommend for most people these days uh, because it's, it's, it's pervasively common to have an egg sensitivity. Uh, why is that? Why is that? So two reasons at least I'll share with you uh, right off the top. We can talk about it separately down the road. Uh, two reasons. Number one, eggs are food for viruses and microorganisms. So if we have poor gut, these microorganisms overpopulate. Microorganisms overpopulate. And what do they like to eat? When we, we're in the lab, in the laboratory, we grow these organisms on what? In the Petri dish, we give them eggs. That's the culture in which we grow them. Okay? Mm -hmm. They feed it. They, they feed on that stuff, so they love it. If, if someone were to get a flu shot, the person giving the flu shot should ask them whether they have an allergy to eggs. eggs. What is a flu shot addressing? A virus, right? Why, did, why, would, it, why, would, that, why would they say that? Because they grew the virus for the shot in a culture of eggs. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So that's one reason. The second reason is that arsenic, unfortunately, which is highly toxic, is also ever-present in most of our eggs. What if it's um, like an organic egg with DHA and omega-3? Doesn't matter. No? Okay. Yeah. So not everybody has that effect, but I can just tell you, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm guessing whether someone will have a sensitivity to eggs, I'm guessing that they will, mm -hmm. irrespective of knowing anything about them. Okay. So you mentioned um, that dairy was an issue for you, is that like, is there something about dairy as a whole for everybody that we should be watching up for? Was, or is that just you being lactose intolerant or what? That's, that's a great question. Uh, you guys are asking really good questions tonight. Put me on the spot. Both of us on the spot. Uh, dairy, we live in a dairy state. So, uh, you can't say too much, they'll come right, after us. Right. So, dairy, dairy is, a, is, a, is problematic. Number one, Irrespective of whether an individual is intolerant or not, first thing dairy does is it increases mucus production. Mm -hmm. What did we say about mucus earlier? What did we say about it? We said mucus is associated with increased what? Histamine. Thank you. You were listening. Okay. You get increased histamine. That's telling you that there's a problem. Histamine is going to cause what? What symptom? Anxiety. Why should we listen to that warning signal? Because that's telling us on the other side of that increased histamine is poor detoxification. 
we got to increase mucus to clean up some junk in the trunk. Do you understand? So dairy products substantially increase mucus, substantially. So if, I, if somebody comes in, they have, if someone, if someone comes in, if someone comes to the office and they have, you know, uh, skin issues, right away, first question I'm going to ask them is, how much dairy are you consuming? Okay. Why? Because that junk is coming out through the skin. The liver cannot handle the process of detoxification of dairy products. Mm -hmm. So I have a story. Have plenty of cheese all you want, but you know that who who wants the cheese? I told you earlier. Who wants the cheese? Who wants the dairy? Who wants the eggs? That's exactly right. The organisms that are present. They're screaming for it. They're sending a signal to the brain and giving you an emotion. You, it's going to attach an emotion to that. When you eat that stuff, do you feel good? It's going to attach that emotion that's sitting there, sit it to the brain and say, ooh, I got to have that piece of cheese. Do you understand? The best thing you can, I'm serious, the best thing you can do is deny. Just like I denied to my wife that I was coughing in the morning. <laughs> deny it. Oh. I, I, my daughter, you can scoot over your Sorry. Out of the screen. I'm, I'm not trying to get out of you. I'm trying to give you, you know, oh. give you the stage. Um, my daughter, she's almost two, but when she was around nine months old, I brought her to Dr. Byron because she had all this eczema on her back, and I couldn't figure out what I was doing. I mean, we, I was doing everything I knew how to do as a doctor, and I was getting goat's milk for her because the cow's milk was bad, um, and he sent me to go get food sensitivity and it was the goat's milk that was triggering this. I cut that goat's milk out. Within a week, her skin was completely clear. Within one week. I mean, she was completely resolved. So it was the, it was the dairy that was triggering that. And here I thought I was being good getting her goat's milk, but yeah. not getting cow's milk, you know. But So we just don't, we don't even have dairy in my house. That's how we just, that's right. why we use coconut milk in our smoothies. Yeah. Yeah. We have, in my household, we haven't had it since 2010. Yeah, haven't had dairy since then. And, and by the way, you know, it, it may sound like I'm, I'm kind of, you know, dropping knowledge here, right? But I live this stuff. Yeah. I live it. We I went through do. this. I, those same questions you guys are asking me, I asked myself because I didn't have the knowledge at the time. I went through this. My family and I, we were eating standard American diet, you know, somewhat cleanly, but we were having dairy every day every day and, and family members were had asthma family members had eczema family members had allergies and I started just where I, I'm sharing with you guys we removed dairy that was the first thing we did massive improvement that's in part what led me to do this kind of work that was one of the triggers I said oh my gosh if this is working for my family maybe it'll work for my patients I started use, utilizing it in, in my patients and, and oh my gosh they would come back and say Dr. Bob, okay now I have this other problem I never told you about okay let's figure that one out mm -hmm. okay so I, I it, you know, understand I, we're human too, and we, we, we go through the same stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and um, what was I just gonna say? I'm just, it's getting late. <laughs> yeah, let's do uh, one or two more questions. Yeah. yeah. Have you, are you familiar with the Dr. Say the alkaline diet? And if so, what's your take on its um, ability to help the body heal itself? Good question. The question was, am I familiar, or are we familiar with the Dr. Sebi diet, mm -hmm. and al specifically the alkaline diet, mm -hmm. Dr. Sebi, and whether or not that has uh, benefits for our health, for us to achieve optimal health. Yes, I'm familiar with uh, Dr. Sebi and his work, who, is, who has since passed away. Um, he, he shared some important, very important concepts, and more specifically, he talked not just about alkaline, alka alkaline diet, but if you study him carefully, he talked about an anti-mucus diet. Mm -hmm. Okay, he talked about an anti-mucus diet. Mm -hmm. Anti-mucus diet is very similar to uh, an, an alkaline diet. Mm -hmm. And he specifically encouraged people to use spe special herbs and natural foods specifically to uh, elicit that. So yes, I'm familiar with him. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I would use his quote unquote diet as a comprehensive diet for all because we are all different mm -hmm. but as a guy it's excellent yeah. I remember what I was gonna say so most <laughs> people come to us to to heal them right but I just want to encourage you guys to know that you guys the things you do every day is how you heal yourselves 
So we'll give you this tidbit of information, but what you guys do and implement in your lives every single day is how you create your own journey to wellness and to optimal health, okay? That's what I was going to say. All right, so we're going to... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just had one last question, if that's okay. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, I was just curious. Um, so I have a pretty clean diet for like the past. I've had it for like six months or so. Um, where everything that I consume is just like natural, like from the earth. Mm -hmm. So um, I get really hungry for like sugar sometimes, like a sugar mm -hmm. craving, because I'm not consuming anything processed. So I try to eat chocolate, like 70% dark chocolate, but I feel like I've been eating too much of it maybe. So I'm, I'm looking for like other sources of sucrose that's healthy, like from obviously like pomegranates and like other fruits, but I'm just curious like what do you guys recommend for that? Well. Usually, if you're craving sugar, there's something deeper going on. Okay. That's probably, you know, whether it's something in the gut or the liver or something, oh, okay. that could be why you're screaming for mm -hmm. sugar. Okay. Um, okay. But, you know, any fruits is a, uh, they have sugar in them, so that's right. like with a lower glycemic, so they're going to mm -hmm. be a nice alternative. Dark chocolate is bad, good, 70, 75%. Yeah. Um, has magnesium in it, yeah. um, so that's a good alternative as well. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, so uh, again, that's a great question because you're asking a question that's based on your cravings, so you're listening to your body, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you listen to your body carefully, you're saying, okay, it's practically telling you what the issue is, all right? Mm -hmm. Saying, okay, uh, you, you crave sugar, but you're replacing that with chocolate. That's a good choice, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're craving sugar, you're craving energy, okay? Mm -hmm. You're craving energy. Mm -hmm. so. What, what forms of energy would you utilize? You would utilize short and long-term forms of energy. The, the, the liver stores sugar, stores sugar in the form of glycogen for about 90 minutes worth. So again, you focus on the liver, look at, look at fruits, okay. uh, very good quality fruits. You're getting a good quality form of sugar uh, with, with fruits. If you can get them in season, great. If not, don't worry about it. We live in Wisconsin and or Northern Illinois, so we cannot go by the typical seasons, otherwise we would starve. Okay. Um, the second thing I would say is, if for example, part of that craving for sugar is in fact including chocolate, then you start looking at chocolate specifically and the ingredients, uh, nu nutrients I should say, in chocolate, even if it's 70%, you say, okay, chocolate's gonna have a fair amount of zinc, but it's also gonna have a lot of copper, okay? Really? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so chocolate, would I, I would begin to think I, this is, again, showing you how I think about that question. Sure. I'll say, okay, could she have copper toxicity and or some derivative of it mm -hmm. uh, leading to a, a quote-unquote craving for it? And that's the way I would, I would look at that. If you had other associated symptoms as well, it would be high on the list. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming out. You can ask a question after um, after we're done. We're going to close it up here. Um, thank you for joining us for our first lecture of the season. We will be back March 7th. So it's the first Thursday in March. Same place, same time um, for Ask the Doctors. We've done this one before. Um, back by popular demand. It's a fun one, so we'll just be in the hot seat up here. You guys can ask us questions. Um, we do have this video on Facebook. Should you need to go back and review it, it is available for you to review. Okay. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming out. Again, there's handouts on your way out, and um, if you want to donate, there is a little cup over there. All right, have a good thank night. You. Drive safe. Hey, thank thanks you. for coming out, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.